Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. I'm over here. <laughs> I see the image up there. <laughs> Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. What about you? He asked, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and he be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus called a crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel, they will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. Please be seated. I found myself really anxious after listening to that second reading today. Holy cow. You know, I feel like whatever I say to you today is liable to send me straight to hell. You know, I, my tongue's going to burst into flames or something. I don't know. So it is with great uh, reserve and with great humility that I place myself before you to share words that hopefully come to us, come to you, inspired by Holy Spirit today, inspired certainly by the Word of God that's been placed before us today. This part of Mark's gospel that we're in is a real turning point for us to spend some time looking at today. You know, just to remind us that, you know, Mark kind of writes in a very abbreviated way. He's to the point. He doesn't put a lot of detail in his gospel. And because of that, it invites us to use our imaginations to allow ourselves to be in the scenes, to be one of the people there with Jesus that Mark is talking about. Because remember, Mark is telling us the good news of Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And the question that's before us is, what kind of Christ is Jesus? What kind of anointed messenger of God is Jesus? Now, it might seem like kind of a weird question, but if we were to read through the first seven chapters of Mark, we would realize the title Christ or the title Messiah has not been used for Jesus by anybody who's been around him. In fact, if we look at what they think about Jesus, what they know about Jesus, it's very confusing to them. You know, I mean, this, this Christ who is Jesus seems to be compassionate. He's more powerful than the spirits. He's humble. He's reconciling. He, he proclaims a kingdom without borders that includes foreigners and former enemies and all peoples. 
He's, he's a Christ who has calmed the storm, come walking across the water, who has fed thousands with five loaves and two fish. And what do his disciples say in response to this? Who is this guy? Who is this who can do all of these things? And so Jesus recognizes that even as the power of God has been flowing through him in healing and great works, his disciples are befuddled. It doesn't fit in to their categories, to their experience, to their expectations. So one more time today we hear Jesus takes his disciples north of the Galilee. So the Galilee region is heavily Jewish region. They're comfortable there. That's home. And he takes them north out of the Galilee, northeast up to this Roman city, Caesarea Philippi. And as soon as you walk into that city, through the villages, you come upon a huge temple to the god Pan, who the Romans say was born there. And that's where the River Jordan dumped into a, a, a cave that seemed to be endless. And he says to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they give to him those answers that come from the crowds. You know, they're, they're using the voice of the crowds. Or oh, you're Elijah, you're John the Baptist, which they know is silly because John was just killed a short time earlier. And to say maybe he was Elijah, that's a possibility because Elijah was supposed to come back to usher in the kingdom of God. But Elijah seemed more like John the Baptist, too. John was, was lifting up the fact that the kingdom was in their midst. So who was this Jesus? And finally, Peter takes the leap. He says to him, you're the Messiah. You're the anointed one of God. And Jesus looks at him and doesn't deny it. And he says, don't tell anybody. Why? Why does Jesus tell them not to tell anybody? Because in the common mind, in Peter's mind, when he uses the term Messiah, Mashiach, in the Hebrew tradition, those who had that title were kings. They were kings, the anointed ones of God. And Jesus does not want them to lift him up and take him and put him on a throne or put him on a war horse or come to him seeking what they think they want, healing and wholeness and goodness, and to overthrow the Romans. That's not who Jesus is. And so he says, yes, I am Messiah, but not the kind that you think. See, because as soon as Jesus doesn't deny he's Messiah, Peter's fantasies start to grow. Peter sees himself alongside King Jesus, establishing the new royal court, throwing out those Pharisees and those Sadducees, throwing out the Romans, throwing out King Herod, and establishing a new kingdom under Jesus. Peter's future, Peter's fortune, Peter's power and identity are tied to Jesus being king. And so when Jesus starts to leave that place with his disciples, he starts to teach about what kind of king, what kind of Mashiach Christ Jesus is going to be for them. He turns his face from that place and starts to head towards Jerusalem. And he says to his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem now. You know what's going to happen to me there? The same thing that's happened to all of the prophets that have preceded me. I will be denied and mocked and ridiculed and accused and belittled and beaten and killed by those who are threatened by the kingdom I'm establishing, but all so I can raise up from the dead so that new life can be found in me. After some time, there will be a new beginning. Now, how do you think Jesus was feeling 
as he was saying this to his disciples? Do you think he's like filled with some kind of sense of joy or excitement? Like he's so confident this is it? Or is it a possibility that Jesus maybe is even a little scared? You know, maybe he's remembering back to that time in the desert after his baptism when he had to face those voices of Satan, those ones who said to him, who do you think you are? Filling him with doubt and denial. Who do you think you are? Are you really that strong? Are you really that confident? And as Jesus says this to them, boldly as he can, not like excited or prophesying it in a way that he has a crystal ball. He's, he's projecting what has happened to all of the prophets before him, just like saying it's going to snow this winter. He's that confident that when he goes to Jerusalem, he will be killed. And because he says that, Peter rebukes him. Peter grabs him, takes him aside. Jesus, that can't be the way it goes. Because as Jesus dies, so there goes Peter's future. There goes Peter's dreams. There goes Peter's power. And he says, Jesus, that's not the kind of Messiah we need you to be. We need you to take care of the Romans. We need you to establish the new kingdom. And Jesus looks at his disciples. He looks in their eyes as Peter is saying this to him. And what does he see in their eyes? Doubt, wonderment, fear. Are we going to Jerusalem to die with him too? What does this mean for our futures? We've connected ourselves to him. Can this be true? Is he just, is, is, is he just blowing smoke? Is this really what's going to happen? Peter's usually right. He's usually the loudest. And Jesus looks in their eyes and sees how they're feeling. And at that point, he turns on Peter. He says, Peter, you are a rock. But I do not need you to be a rock in front of me, causing me to stumble on my path to do God's will. Get behind me, you Satan. Get behind me, you deceiver. Get behind me, you short-sighted one. Because you're not looking at this through God's eyes. You're looking at this through your own eyes, Peter. You're seeing your own wants in this situation, and it's not in accord with God's kingdom. Get behind me. But you know, Jesus doesn't condemn Peter to hell. He's not calling him Satan to say, you're evil. He's saying that to Peter to put him in his proper place, in his proper relationship with the teacher Messiah. Peter, come behind me, come closer to me, and follow me. That's a very different way of thinking about that situation than Jesus casting Peter out or telling him to go away. Now, he needs Peter to be the strong one so those disciples will stop having doubt and fear and will follow Jesus as well. So P Jesus continues to teach about what then it means to be a follower, his, to be a disciple. And they're walking down this road, and the Romans during those days often used crosses, crucifixions, along the main roads to deter people from rebelling. And there were no doubt along this main road that they were walking down towards Jerusalem, crucifixes, maybe even some with skeletons still hanging on them. And Jesus points at one of these crosses, and he says to his disciples, Look, when you risk your lives to live the kingdom I'm proclaiming, to follow me, to bring good news to the marginalized, to those who are vulnerable, to those who have been judged as unworthy, when you risk to do that, you risk the cross. And the only way that you can truly follow me in this kingdom of God that I'm proclaiming is to daily 
take up this cross. I'm not talking about the cross of suffering that comes with human frailty, with ailments, with broken bones or upset stomachs. No, we're talking about the kind of suffering that comes from people's judgment when we act in loving and compassionate and forgiving ways. When we behave the ways God calls us to behave empowered by Holy Spirit. We risk the cross. When we refuse to cheat, we risk the cross. When we refuse to laugh at racial jokes or use labels that degrade or dehumanize other people, we risk the cross. When you decide to attend church instead of another tournament game, you risk the cross. When you invite a Muslim or a gay person to your card club, you risk the cross. When you refuse to run over a snake in the road just because you can, you risk the cross. When you give $10 to the bum on the street corner without asking any questions, you risk the cross. When you refuse to turn, return evil for evil, when you refuse to insult when insulted, when you refuse to raise your voice when being yelled at, you risk the cross. So how do we keep from falling into the sin that Peter suffered that led to him being called Satan? How do we stay away from deception how do we avoid seeing merely with human eyes when we are gifted with divine perspective? Jesus says, place yourselves behind me. Listen. Deny your own wants. Surrender to the needs of others who depend on you. Do the loving, merciful, generous thing then you will live well in the kingdom, Jesus proclaims.